Jesus in prayer, Luke chapter 22. That's a really deceiving title. It's going to be a lot more than prayer, but that's where we'll start. In the Gospel of Luke, you could break it up into two categories, uh, declarations of Jesus and demonstrations of Jesus. The declarations of Jesus and what he's teaching us that's true and how he's teaching us about the world and the things he's teaching us uh, and how to live. And then we have the demonstrations of Jesus or, or how he lives that out. And in this text this morning, we see Jesus, Jesus demonstrating for us relationship with the Father, and we get to look in on this intimate portrait of the Son talking with the Father. And so we're going we're gonna to look a little bit about what we can learn uh, from Jesus about prayer, but then we're going to focus in on the content of that prayer and why Jesus is uh, experiencing such uh, an intense amount of personal stress that we'll see here in the text. So Luke chapter 22, verse 39 Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. Upon reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew from them about a stone's throw beyond, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Then he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples. He found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Jesus in prayer. A few things we can learn from Jesus in prayer. Number one, place. As we, just, as we just watch the example of Jesus, we, we see this regularly happening throughout the Gospel of Luke, and the other Gospels recorded as well, Jesus regularly going away to a specific place to pray. And you can obviously pray wherever you're at. You can pray right now. I'm praying right now in my mind and my heart for you and for me in this moment. So you can pray anywhere at any time, in any way, but, and, and you need a place. You need a place to go and pray. And Jesus here withdrew to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples, upon reaching that place, he said, hey, we're going to do some praying. Jesus regularly stepped away from the busyness and the craziness of life so he could focus his mind and heart on communicating with his Father and hearing from his Father. You need a place. I have places. I have, I, have, I shared this on Thursday night. I have four places I pray. And don't hold this against me. And don't think less of me. This is just where I pray. I pray in the hot tub. I love the hot tub, okay? I get out there early in the morning or late at night, and everyone's not there. They're asleep. They're gone. They're somewhere else. It's dark, and I just like, it's safe. And Daisy's there, so she can, you know, bark if a bad guy comes, and I got to run away in my shorts. But, you know, I'm just out there, and, and you're, just, you're, just, you're out there looking at the stars, and, and I pray. I talk to the Lord. I hear from the Lord. I get out of the hot tub, and I journal, and I take notes of what God's been talking to me because prayer is communication with God, right? It, it's talking to him and, and hearing from him, and so... So I go to my hot tub, and there's something about getting in. I hear the, the lid pop, boom, and I'm with the Lord. It's just something about that place is when I'm with the Lord. Second place is my mountain bike. And, and I don't, don't think too highly of me. I don't do this a lot. But, but when I do get on my mountain bike to do uh, the painful exercise of going up and down Fairview Canyon, uh, I pray. Put earbuds in, uh, get a little worship music going, and I pray and I talk to the Lord because it's my way of trying to survive mountain biking. Maybe if I'm talking to God, uh, he'll let me live through this event. And so, and so I pray. I get on my bike, and, and they're just, that's what starts happening. Third place is, is in my car. It's probably been 10 years since I've hit the button and turned the radio on in my car. If we're with a family on a road trip, hey, crank it up, country tunes, love it. But when I'm by myself, uh, it's, it's just me and the Lord. And I'm windshield time, and I'm just thinking and talking and praying. I have my places that I go when I'm there. I, I'm ex I expect to talk with God. You need a place. Jesus had a place, and he's demonstrating here for us that if you want to learn to talk with the Lord and you have a, an intimate prayer life, you need to find a place. It could be a closet, a bedroom. It could be a dining room table. It could be find your place. You need a place. Secondly, prayer partners. Jesus had prayer partners. Now, granted, they were lousy ones, okay? But, but he oftentimes took his disciples with him away to pray, and, and you need partners in prayer. Uh, I've... Uh, uh, 
invited multiple people into my life. Would you be willing to get a text or email from me ever so often? I believe God's given you the gift of intercession, and I need it. And would you be willing to pray for me? Yes. And so while I know many of the dear people at Grace City pray for me and my family often, which we dearly appreciate and we love, there are also a handful of folks that I send very specific prayer, prayers to on a daily, weekly, monthly basis as needed, and they, they pray for me. Now, here, here, here's, here's what, what, I, what, what I want to say briefly about this is, it, it's easy for us to be um, harsh for the, on the disciples, right? You mean they went to, you got to go pray with Jesus and you fell asleep? That, that, that's like, you mean you got to go play catch with King Griffith Jr. and you fell asleep? It's like, dude, like, like this would be amazing. How, how, how could you do that? Well, let's look at the text here, verse 45. When Jesus arose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from what? Sorrow. Okay, they weren't bored and different or playing video games. They had been trying emotionally to keep up with Jesus and all that was going on, and it was hard on them. It was hard on them, and they were exhausted. And so let's not be too harsh on them. They were trying, uh, God bless them, uh, but they were exhausted because they were realizing that Jesus uh, was not going to establish the kind of kingdom they had anticipated. It was going to be a spiritual kingdom, not first and primarily a physical kingdom, and that meant great suffering for them, and that made great, great suffering for their Savior, and this was washing over them as they realized, we're probably not going to get out of Jerusalem alive. And so they're a little tired, and they're a little exhausted, and quite frankly, Jesus had a motor. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, he was going and teaching and preaching and like preaching all day and sleeping on, on rocks at night. I mean, the guy was a stud, and they were a little tired. They were a little overwhelmed and just kind of emotionally like, like, like we're, we're tapped out. We're maxed. We're redlining. And, and they fell asleep from exhaustion. So a couple of takeaways from this. Don't go too hard on your friends who let you down. Not by a show of hands, but how many of you have had Christian brothers or sisters that you feel as if in your moment of need, they let you down? They weren't there. They didn't call. They didn't text. They, they didn't seem to care. And, and, and they just let you down. Well, here's my gentle word of encouragement for you. Get over it. <laughs> just, just, just let it go. Do you know why? Because a, you should, because a lot of people carry internal hurt from expectations they put on other people that those people didn't even know they had and didn't meet. Yep. I thought you would do this. I thought you would do that. You never did it. Now I'm going to hold a grudge against you, or I'm going to be a little cold to you, or I'm going to be a little uh, uh, relationally, emotionally distant from you. That's immaturity. To put expectations on someone they don't even know are on them, and then hold them to it, and then, and then punish them when they fail to meet expectations that you set on them that they didn't know they had, or you had. It, it's immaturity. So you should let it go, because the path to maturation and personal maturation uh, does not go through holding personal grudges against expectations you put on people. Pa personal maturation is, is, is forgiving people and being gracious toward people. The second reason you should do it is because you let people down and you let yourself off the hook. Think how many times you've let somebody down. You weren't the friend they needed. You weren't the brother or sister they needed. You said you'd pray for them and then you totally spaced and did it. I mean, like, that's life in a fallen world. None of us are perfect, thanks be to God. Uh, there's moments of grace when we're actually the kind of friend that people need. But let's be gracious and kind. Jesus didn't come say, you know what? I've had it. You can't keep up with me. You, you fell asleep. I'm going to die in a few moments for you, oh, by the way. And you couldn't even stay up and pray with me for five minutes. I'm done. I'll start with some, over with some, you know, 12 new guys, and we'll figure it out. He, he just comes, and he wakes him up, and he's like, hey, guys, I know you're tired. Let's try again. And he keeps loving them. And he keeps staying in relationship with them. And you should stay in relationship with your brothers and, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ as well. Third, posture. Look at the posture of Jesus. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall in temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed. More than just the physical posture is the spiritual posture of Jesus in that we see he is fully submitted to the will of the Father. We're going to see in a moment that he's going to, he's going to ask the Lord, make a request. He's going to make a request of God the Father that the plan get adjusted. And when God the Father doesn't answer, he says, I get it. Your will be done, not mine. He's, he's physically posturing himself in the position he wants his heart, which is full submission before the Father. And you can pray standing up. You can pray sitting down. You can pray riding your mountain bike. You can pray in a car. You can pray running. You can pray, you can pray in any posture. But there's something unique about the physical posture of prayer when we kneel, this should be practiced at some point in, in, in your life. You get down on your knees and you're just like, Lord, maybe it's with your kids or with your spouse. You're like, I'm here on my knees just to physically set myself right before you. 
this posture I'm embodying in my physical body is, is reminding me of the posture I want to have before you in my heart, which is, which is kneeling before you as the God of the universe, as the Father of all things, as the sovereign, sovereign one who knows around the corner and knows my whole past and can see all things at once, and I should submit to you even when I don't understand what's going on and would like you to change the, the plan. The posture of prayer is so important. If we come in demanding and informing, Gord, did you know? Yeah, he does, okay? You know, and, we, and we're arguing and, and, and this and that. The, the, how many people do you have a relationship with who, who all you do or all they do with you is gripe, complain, critique, inform, yell? It's like, that's not a relationship. That's like something you have to like try to survive. And the posture of our heart when we come to the Father should be one of, of kneeling before him in humility so that we can speak honestly to him and then receive from him what he would have. So we learn from Jesus' uh, example here. You need a place, you need, you need partners, you need, you need a posture, and then you're praying to a person. Uh, it, he's talking here with his, with his father. It's a, it's, a, it's a profound picture of, of uh, the, this, this Trinitarian uh, interaction between the Spirit of God filling and dwelling uh, the Son of God who's then talking to Father God. And, and, and when you and I pray, we need to remember that it's not about informing an impersonal force about what's going on in the world around us. It's about cultivating a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so sometimes I think prayer becomes challenging for us because we focus on prayer rather than prayer becoming focusing on developing a relationship with the Father. If you struggle with prayer, like I have, my, my, so prayer does not come easy. It's hard. I mean, how many times do you like... Dear Heavenly God of the universe, I lift up my... Oh, did I turn the oven off? Okay, I did. Yes, Lord. And we come to you now, Father, and the garage door... Okay, it's closed. Okay. And so anyways, what I was saying was, why did that person not text me back? That's so weird. I texted him like three times. I wonder if my text was too long. Oh, I always text too long. Anyways, Lord, so I, it wasn't that long. Okay, Lord, help me with my texting. I mean, we, we, we just like, we just get distracted into these stupid prayers, right? It's like, ah, it's like, because, and then, and then, and then if you're like me, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I need to pray. I need to pray. Here I am, Lord, I'm praying. I need to pray. I want to pray. Gosh, I hate praying. How do I pray? And you know, it's like, ah. So when we focus on prayer, we forget that prayer is actually just talking to God. And so stop focusing on prayer and start talking to the Father. Because you're, in a, you're interacting with the person. It's not about information download. Lord, did you know that Putin attacked Ukraine last week? A couple of years like, like, Lord, where were you at? I, I didn't know until I read it on, on CNN. I know, Father, forgive me. I read CNN. Anyways, um, <laughs> Lord, <laughs> that was funny. Um, <clears throat> We're not informing God about, about if you listen to people, how, how sometimes they pray, I can tell you what they think about God. It's like they're informing him of these things that like, newsflash, he already knows. It's about talking to a person, cultivating a relationship. Number five, power. Look at the story. He prays, verse 47, we're going to keep reading. While Jesus was still speaking, a crowd came up and the man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Now, remember, relational context here is one of Jesus' closest friends. Been living with him, ministering with him, discipling him, investing in him, working alongside him, eating meals with him, traveling with him, joking around with him for three years, three solid years. When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them, we know Peter, struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. Now, that's, that's the power part, and I'll show you why. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. It's more like Jesus is kind of just talking out loud to himself at that moment. You know what I mean? Like, like really, guys? This, you boggle my mind. I mean, I know you're sinners. I know you hate me. Judas, I know you betrayed me. Really? 
M16s and tanks. I mean, look at me. What am I going to do? Like, like, like I, you could have arrested me during the day. Oh, you came at night? Oh, because you are of the night. Interesting. Okay, well, let's go. Why is that demonstration of power? Because Jesus was asking to avoid that conversation. He was asking the Father to avoid the situation. There's a path I know we agreed that I would walk, and I'm here perfectly willing to submit myself to that path, but I want to respectfully ask, Father, if we could take a different road. Now, you know, you know the, the difference in your child's heart, right? When they come to you and like, I don't want to clean my room and I don't want to whatever and I don't want to whatever. That's a rebellious heart, a whiny heart, and that needs to be dealt with, right? That's very different than, hey, mom, dad, I know you asked me to do the dishes and, and I humbly uh, uh, submit to your authority in my life and I plan on in the power of the spirit uh, um, being able to, to, to do that. Um, but I, I, I was wondering, I, I was wanting to get some, some homework done first or to work on some Latin or to work on my piano or I was wanting to go outside and rake the leaves or, or I, I, I would like to kill, still serve you, but could we do it a different way? And you're like, hey, let's, let's talk. This is great. When there's that respectful attitude there, you're like, let's do this all day. This wasn't Jesus going, I don't want to do it. it was, he was like, Lord. He was like, Father, I'm in. Because this is the plan we agreed upon, and, 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 and your way is perfect, and, and we need to do this. I get it. But if there is another way, I'd be in for that too. But not my will, but your, yours be done. This is Jesus demonstrating for us perfect submission. Perfect submission to the Father. And, then, and, then, and the, Lord, the, the Lord gives him an answer. Because the Lord always answers our prayers. You know, the Father always answers. And the Father always answers yes, no, or not yet. Just like you as a good parent. Always give your kids answers if you're a good parent. Mom, can I go out and play in the street? No. Mom, can I go play in the backyard with the dog? Yes. Mom, uh, can I go drive the car? You know, well, you're seven. Not yet. <laughs> right? No, yes, not yet. A good parent always gives a child an answer. And the father is good, and he gave his son an answer, which was, we're going to stay the course. And then Jesus got up from that place and he walked out into the greatest tragedy that has ever befallen any human being in, in, in the history of humanity with power to submit to the Father's will in the face of it. He knelt in the place of prayer and then he received power from the Father and then he stood up and he walked out in that power to walk into the will of God for his life. Part of the purposes of prayer is to get our heart aligned with the Father so we can leave our place of, pr of prayer in power to do the will of God. Right. And Jesus demonstrates that for us perfectly in this text. So from Jesus, we learn a few things. Number one, we learn that prayer reveals our heart. Prayer reveals our heart. I love praying out loud with other people because it tells me where their heart's at. It also tells me where, where my heart's at. And so when I pray to the, to the Father... When I'm alone, I, I've started praying out loud. You know, people, and, 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 and you know, 10 years ago, people used to look at me in the car and think like, oh, there's a guy who's lost his mind. Now they just think I'm probably talking on Bluetooth. So it's awesome. <laughs> so it's like, it's like, you got no excuse here. You should just pray out loud. Like, because it's, it's I'm a verbal processor. And, and, I, and I, I, if I'm stuck mentally or emotionally, I can start verbalizing it. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, Lord. Even as I'm talking, I realize how stupid that sounds. Thank you for listening to me. I got it. Let me make some adjustments here to my attitude. Just verbally processing out loud helps re reveal to me, in the presence of the Father, where my heart's at so I can realign my heart with the heart of God. Secondly, we see that prayer works better when we don't focus on it. I already touched on that. We don't see Jesus showing up in the garden Father, I'm here to pray, and while I pray, I'll get on my knees, and I'm going to pray. And hopefully these guys are watching me to learn how they can pray. No, he, he gets to his place, he kneels down, and he pours out his heart to the Father. Because he's not focusing on prayer, he's focusing on a relationship. We learn that in prayer we can turn to God in our hour of suffering. It, it's interesting to note, Jesus knows what's coming. Now, you and I can only um, worry about what's coming, Right? We can only project what's coming. This isn't going to go good, or oh man, that person's not going to like this, or oh, this won't go well, or oh man, this is going to be bad. Jesus just didn't have an idea what was coming. He knew explicitly what was coming. In all of its gruesome details, he knew exactly what was coming, which is actually worse. Because when you and I just think about what's coming, we're, we're like, well, there's always the off chance it might not happen. Jesus knew that it was absolutely going to happen. And he didn't argue with God. He didn't turn on God. Because you and I sometimes can turn on God. Like, why is this happening? 
Jesus didn't turn on God. He turned to God the Father in his hour of suffering, which is instructive for us. In your hour of suffering, don't, don't argue with God, blame God, attack God, turn to God. Lord, I don't know why this is happening. And I'm going to be honest, this is frustrating because I don't get it. I'm here asking for your help to process it and then power to endure it. We learn that sometimes your friends will fail you. We already talked about that. We, turn, we learn that prayer is not relationship or information about relationship. I covered all this. This is great. What's up with the cup? That's what I want to get to. So skip, 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 boom. What's up with the cup? Look at the text. He would drew out a stone's throw away and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Angels we see in the New Testament have, have two roles, as well as the Old Testament. They're, they're messengers and ministers. And so wherever we see angels showing up in the story of God, they're either there to bring a message from God or they're there to minister on behalf of God. So we see Mary uh, have an angel come and say, hey, guess what? You're going to be a mother without help of a husband because God is going to use you as the Virgin Mary to bring his perfect son into the world. That's a message. I mean, that, that's quite the message, if you ask me. And then we see the ministers where, where angels come and they minister to people in their hour of need. You need to know, if you're new to Christianity or just, just checking things out, that the biblical worldview teaches us that there is a spiritual realm and there are both angels and demons, okay? And so some people who are, are like, well, I'm, I'm not sure about Jesus, but I'm kind of spiritual. I like the idea of angels. That's kind of nice to kind of, you know, keep my car on the road as I'm driving down the highway and wake me up when I fell asleep, you know, and, woo, woo, and I, I, yeah, I got, I got protective angels. That's nice to think about. But they never think about the, the, the converse of that, which is demons. And demons are just as real as angels. Demons are fallen angels, okay? So angels of God bring messages from God. Fallen angels also bring messages. They bring contorted messages and false messages and counterfeit messages. So, so God has spoken to us through his word to bring the message of truth. And then the, the, the counterfeit angels, the fallen angels, the demons come and, and, and they confuse us with the message. And did God really say that? And would, would Jesus really talk like that? And blah, blah, blah. They confuse us. They come with false messages and they come as ministers of um, accusation. They don't come to build us up. They come to tear us down. They don't come to uh, remind us of the things of God. They come to lie to us about the things of God. They don't come to minister to us. They come to tear us down. So here we see these angels ministering to Jesus. And then verse 44, and being in anguish, Jesus prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, th th this isn't a metaphor. This isn't an analogy. This isn't like... This is a, a, a physiological reality. This, is, this has been scientifically proven, medically tested, that there is a, a phenomena that can happen to a human being that when they are under such psychological, emotional, mental, physiological stress, that their body can actually sweat drops of blood. But it only happens in the most severest of severe turmoil and trial. Without a show of hands, how many of you in here have faced something so terrifying, so traumatic, so tragic that you actually sweat, you sweated drops of blood, okay? It, probably not many of us, if any of us. That's the kind of turmoil Jesus is going through. And it's important for us to see because it's easy for us to think this was a walk in the park. Jesus came down. He was man, but he was God. And so how hard was it to be man, really? And then he, he knew what was going to happen. He knew the, end of the score at the end of the game. He knew they were going to win. He's like, you know, let's just get through this rough first half. The second half is amazing. No, no, no. Jesus was fully God, yes, and he was fully man, experiencing all of the heartache and the turmoil and the, the inner tr uh, 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 trials that would come, the confliction that would come with following God and obeying his will in a fallen world when obeying God hurts, when obeying God brings pain, and specifically here, when obeying God will result in God turning his back on you. If we're going to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and we're going to fully appreciate what's happening here in the life of Jesus and what's happened to make available for you grace, 
by which through faith you can tap into and experience reconciliation with the Father, we need to step into for a moment the pain of Jesus considering dying for his enemies. Because you think of oftentimes Jesus dying for you, and you're like, you're like, like, like I get it. I mean, look at me, right? You no, know, Jesus is going to die for Judas. Jesus is going to die for everyone who had been attacking him for the last three years. Jesus is going to die for Putin. Jesus was going to die for your mother-in-law. That was probably too close. Jesus, <laughs> you know what I mean? Jesus is going to die for everyone, including you. And you're on the same list as Putin and your mother-in-law, by the way. And he's anticipating what it's going to cost him physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally with the Father, and it's causing such stress and turmoil that he is literally sweating drops of blood. It's remarkable. So, what's with the cup? What does the cup represent? Well, and this is where we're just going to read a bunch of Bible verses. What you need to realize is that God hates some things. God hates some things. And what Jesus was understanding in this moment is that Jesus was going to become that which God hates. Jesus was going to literally become that which God the Father hates. And it, and it caused him deep emotional, relational, mental, physiological turmoil, thinking, I'm going to become all that the Father hates, all that I have hated. I'm going to take those things upon myself. The Bible talks about the cup of the wrath of God. And it's this cup that, that, that every, every ungodly action, every ungodly word, every ungodly thought that you have is like filling this cup up until that cup is full. And then God takes his wrath and he takes the cup and he pours that cup back out on your head. And the sin that you, that you filled the cup up with now becomes the wrath of God against you because of that sin. Look at Psalm 5, verse 5. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You, this is the psalmist speaking of God, you hate all who do wrong. Now, track with that. Because we often say, you know, uh, uh, love the sinner, hate the sin, which I think is helpful in relationship to how we as humans should interact with each other and try to live out our Christianity in a fallen world. But, but hear this, that, that is not the posture of God toward humanity. Paul says, you were once darkness. I, I, remember, I remember hearing Dad preach a sermon on this. You probably remember this, Dad. I was, I was like 12. You were once darkness, Ephesians 4, I think. Yeah, four. Now you are light. Not you were in darkness, or you did dark things, or you had dark thoughts. You were darkness itself. Paul's very careful with his language. He's very, he's very precise. He's not like, oh, I wish I would have said you did dark things. I didn't mean you were dark. No, no, no. Paul thought it through. You were darkness. Now you are light. There was no separation between your actions and your person. It's not like you'll stand before God and God will go, look, you know what? Um, um, love the sinner, hate the sin. I hate your sin, but I love you, so you're in. God will see you and your sin as one. And he will pour out wrath on both your sin and you who did the sin. So we need to be careful not to let ourselves off the hook. I think God loves the sinner, hates the sin. I think I'm okay. No, 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 no. God doesn't love you in your sin. He hates you in your sin. You're like, this isn't very encouraging. Well, come back on Easter Sunday morning. It gets better. But you got to hear the bad news before the good news makes sense. You hate all who do wrong. That's an anomaly, you say. Okay, keep reading here. Psalm 11, verse 4 and 5. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. Who is righteous in the world? No one except one, which was Jesus. Jesus was the only one who God loved due to his righteousness. And the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. Who's the wicked? Everyone else who isn't Jesus. 
Look at this. He, he, he could have said he hates slightly. He hates mildly. He hates sort of. He hates part of the time. No, he hates with a passion. On the wicked, he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. And if you don't know what a scorching wind is, you don't want to know. It's not like, oh, that's kind of hot. It's like vaporizing. Another anomaly. Okay, how about Hosea 9? Because of all their wickedness in Gilgal, I hated them there. Because of their sinful deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will no longer love them. God is love. God loves the world. Not here. God hates sin. God hates sinners. God's wrath, Psalm 7, verse 11. God is a righteous judge, a God who displays his wrath every day. What does that mean? Well, there, 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 there's... There's two sides of wrath that we need to understand. Ephesians 5, verse 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. That's a present tense sort of pouring out of God's wrath. Meaning, in in many ways, God is right now, real time, pouring out his wrath. Or Colossians 3, verse 5, Put to death, therefore, Whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. So one wrath was present tense. One wrath is future tense. What's Paul saying here? What's Jesus referring to when he talks about the cup of the wrath of God? Well, lots going on here. Let's start with this. Don't take lightly things that will receive God's wrath being poured over them. Now, this is a sobering word. Stop and think about how many things you've laughed at at that TV show that is kind of your little guilty pleasure that God's like, I'm not laughing. It's not cute. I am pouring and will pour out my wrath in direct response to the very thing you're entertaining yourself with right now. God's like, I don't think you're cute. I don't think you're funny. I don't think you're creative. I don't care about your preferences. I don't care about your personal opinion. This I hate and I will pour out wrath. Parents, this is why you got to care about your kids when they rebel against God's word. Oh, I don't think they're doing so good. Well, we'll just pray for them. No, go get them. Go get them. Be loving, be kind, be prayerful, be wise, but go get them. Well, they're 23. They can make their own decisions. Okay, but how's it going for them? I, 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 I just, my, my mind boggles at, at the indifference that we can have towards sin. And I realize it's because we've lost perspective on what sin brings. Sin earns and guarantees God's wrath. And God's wrath is holy and God's wrath is permanent, and God's wrath is final, and God's wrath is terrifying, and God's wrath is complete, and God's wrath is sovereign, and God's wrath is thorough. There's a sobering word. We're kind of blithely going through life, and Jesus is in the garden sweating drops of blood because Jesus is clear on the wrath of God, Jesus is clear what it entails. Jesus is clear what will happen when that cup is poured out. And he's preparing to put himself under that waterfall of fire wrath for you. It's a big deal. Wrath is a big deal. Sin is a big deal. And and we're living in a culture that doesn't just mind sinful activity. It celebrates and rewards sinful activity. Lust, greed, materialism, sensuality, sexual sin, self-centeredness, greediness, and and on down the list. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming, Paul said. The two tenses. 
Passive wrath and active wrath. This is what you need to understand about the wrath of God. There, there is one sense that the passive wrath of God has come and, and, and is here even now against sinful behavior. And there is another sense that the active wrath of God has yet to come and will come soon. And so let me explain these two categories for you quickly. Passive wrath, this is explained in Romans chapter 1. So the wrath of God is being poured out right now on the world and on you if you're not in Christ. And this is how it works. Paul explains in chapter 1. The wrath of God, there's the phrase, is being revealed. That's ongoing present tense. It's, it's actively happening right now as you yawn your way through the sermon and kind of blow yourself through the week, just blow here and go here. No, the wrath of God coming out right now, revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without what? What are you good at doing? Making excuses. And God's like, good for you, doesn't wash. I love the phrase, his invisible qualities are clearly seen. What God is saying here through Paul is quite simple. The only way you look around and see creation in all of its beauty and see creation in all of its splendor and see life in all of its intricate complexities and think no God is to in your heart say, I don't like him, screw him, I'm going to reject him. You don't get there logically. You don't get there scientifically. You get there rebelliously. That's right. 100%. You get there when you choose to reject the reality of God. And I always find it interesting, those that are the most vociferous and, 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 and um, uh, rigorous in their rejection of God, it's like, if he's not there, why make such a big deal about him? Yeah. If he's not there, why are you so passionate about trying to talk everyone, including yourself, into thinking he's not there. If he's not there, it's like, I don't go around arguing about the boogeyman. He's not there. He's not there. Like, Bro, calm down. Why would you argue against something that was there unless in, internally you knew and you hated what was there? Because what it would require from you, which is humility and repentance. And so they deny the truth of God, even though he, in his grace and mercy, has made it plain to them. God isn't up hiding himself and then like zapping sinners. Ha, 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 ha. But God, how? No, no. No excuse. Paul's not done. Look what he continues to say. For although they knew God, there it is. There's no atheist that doesn't know God is tr true. They neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Don't you see this everywhere? Though they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. What's he saying? He's saying they exchanged worshiping the true God for idols. They exchanged worshiping the one true God who sits on the throne over all to worship things like food, sex, money, power, idols, sports figures, entertainment figures, children, fill in the blank, a spouse, a marriage, a relationship. They, they stopped worshiping the one true God and they worshiped false gods and then the zinger. Therefore, God gave them over. And that's the passive wrath of God. And then, and then, and then through the rest of the chapter, you've got to read it, through the rest of the chapter, and God gave them over, and God gave them over, and God gave them over, and God, he's given them over to their lusts and over to their idolatrous desires and over to their, 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 their greedy impulses. And, and God's passive wrath is saying, okay. Mom, I want to play on the freeway. No. Mom, I want to play in the freeway. No. Mom, I want to play in the freeway. Okay. That's the passive wrath of God. That he lets you 
do what you want to do, and it destroys you. Because of your evil impulses, because of your self-centered flesh, he lets you have what you want, he lets you get what you demanded, and it destroys you. We see the passive wrath of God everywhere we look in the world today, where God is giving people up and giving people over to what they said they really wanted, and it never goes well for them or humanity in general. Because when we abandon God and demand our own way, it just, imagine your three-year-old kid, imagine giving your three-year-old kid everything they demanded. How, how well would it go for them? They wouldn't live out the day. And that's us. Right now in our world, the United States of America is actively under the passive wrath of God. When we appoint people to the highest court in the land who can't define a man or a woman, we have problems. And the passive wrath of God will absolutely be on our land. This is a real thing. This is a terrifying thing. And this is an avoidable thing. <laughs> Mom, can I play in the street? No. Mom, can I play in the street? No. Mom, can I? Hey, wait. Thanks for keeping me from playing in the street. My bad. Where do you want me to play? How about that for an approach to life? The passive wrath of God is wrath that you choose to live under when you run away from the precepts and the principles of God himself. Here's the act of wrath, chapter 4, verse 10 of Revelation. They too will drink the wine of God's fury. This is, this is that, that, that cup imagery, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the lamb. Newsflash, the lamb is Jesus. You're going to fill up this cup of wrath with all of your self-centered, cheap, flesh-driven, sinful acts and behaviors, and if there is no repentance before you die, God will take that cup of wrath and he will pour it burning down your throat. But then there's this word, atonement. You see, if the story ended there, we'd say like, well, it makes sense because God's holy, we've screwed things up, if justice is to, is, is to stand, and if justice is to mean anything as a word, then evil has to get punished. That makes sense. But there's this word called atonement or propitiation, if you want the big $3 theological word, that Jesus is stepping into in this moment, which is why he's sweating drops of blood. Because atonement isn't cheap. Propitiation comes at a cost. Paul says it like this. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. It's like, oh, that's cool. Now keep reading. God presented Christ as a what? Sacrifice of atonement. Or Christ became our propitiation, quite literally, through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Meaning if there was no bloodshed, if there was no cost to, if there was no price paid for sin, you can't get atonement. And this is being watered down and, 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 and kind of chased out of the church today. And it's, it, it's, it's heresy. Salvation doesn't come without sacrifice. Salvation doesn't come without blood being shed. And here in the garden, Jesus' blood is shed for the first time, but it won't be the last. Listen to 1 John 2. He is the propitiation or atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. What's, Paul, what's, Paul's, what's John saying here? He's saying there's not one person in the world who, if they were to turn to the Father, there would not be blood shed to cover their sins. It's not as if Jesus is like, I'm going to go here, but I'm only good for about 16 billion people. And then, and then the 16th billion, the number one person, they're just, they're just out of luck. My blood will be shed because I'm the perfect, flawless lamb of God. My sacrifice will be perfect for the world 
were they to turn from their sins to me in 1 John 4. You're like, how is this loving? This is how it's loving. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Jesus came for this moment. And in perfect submission to the Father, he's like, this is going to cost me my life in our relationship in this moment when you turn your back on me and I become the recipient of all of the stored up wrath of God from history past to history future and all the sins of Josh and Greg and Candy and Sharon and Levi and LMA and Amelia and, and, and Kidian are going to be poured out on me. And the sin of those seven saps is way more than I'd like to bear. Not even taking into consideration you. Think about you. Think about your sin. Think about the wrath of God stored up for your sin alone, multiplied by the sins in this room, and start to feel the weight that Jesus carried in the garden. And then multiply out across this town, and then this county, and then this state, dear Lord, and then the country, and then the globe, and then history, and you're beginning to taste a portion of what Jesus carried in full this night. No wonder his disciples fell asleep in sorrow, exhausted from sorrow. Only someone like Jesus could carry this. John 3, 36. There's only two kinds of people in the world. The band can come out and prepare us for communion. There's only two kinds of people in the world. We tend to break up history into, you know, Race, clashes, uh, 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 um, classes, nations, you know, it's like there's only two classes of people in the world. Those who believe this is true and those who reject it as true. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son of Man has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, but God's wrath remains on them. If you're outside of Christ, the path of wrath of God is on you right now in the form of consequences, and they're real, aren't they? Think about your life. You've screwed it up. You've rejected God. You've argued him away. You've chosen not to live by his precepts and principles. How's it going for you? How are your relationships? I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm trying to get you to be honest in the assessment of your life. Just, just assess how your life is going apart from Jesus. That's, that's the passive wrath of God. It's called consequences. It's called you apart from God. But there is another kind of wrath coming, and it is, it is the active wrath of God where he will come and he will then actively pour his wrath over you and bring consequences on your life and judge you, not just your sin. He'll judge. He's not sending your sin to hell. He's sending you to hell. This is as serious as it gets. There needs to be a somberness that's restored to the people of God and a, and, and a sense of seriousness that comes in our life that, that, that sometimes we have pastors, we work with people and they're like, hey, can't you just kind of wipe? No, no, this is a big deal. You're currently acting in such a way for God to hate you. But there is a way that you can act so that he would love you, not that you do better and he rewards your performance, but that you admit that you're a sinner and you invite his presence into your life and his forgiveness in your life, and you say, you know what? I'm an idiot. I would like to take the Jesus road where he absorbs my wrath, and the Father delights in giving you that kind of grace so the righteousness of Christ can become yours, and the sin that you earn becomes the son's. Are you appreciating yet the submission of Jesus to the Father? Are you appreciating yet what Jesus will? Jesus said, no one takes up my life. I lay it down willingly. This wasn't God the Father strong-arming Jesus to the cross. This was God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit working in perfect harmony to lay themselves down sacrificially in love so that you might be forgiven and they could still be just in forgiving sinners like you, Romans 3. So there's only two kinds of people in the world. Those who believe in the Son and have eternal life and those who reject the Son and do not have eternal life and are living under the passive wrath of God now and will receive in full the act of wrath of God when they die. Friend, who are you? It's my job to deliver the news. It's your job to respond to the news. It's my job to proclaim the truth. It's your job to receive the truth and then act on the truth. Friend, where are you? 
If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you fill your heart welling with gratitude this morning, again, that you could receive the grace of God when you had actually lived in such a way as to earn the wrath of God. And you're, you're, you're like, wrap to the servant pastor so I can come take communion and sing and celebrate once again the good news of the grace of God that I don't get what I deserve. And some of you are terrified right now because you realize you're on the wrong side of history, friend. There's a way to cross over. And it may be that God has orchestrated every moment in your life to this moment now, that you would hear the free offer of salvation, that by grace through faith you can receive eternal life when you bow your knee to the Father and say, I'm a screw-up, I'm a sinner, I need help, I'm humbling myself and asking Jesus to forgive me of my sins and grant me eternal life. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? If that is you, do not miss, friend, this opportunity. Here's, here's what God has lined out for you in your life with your head bowed and, and your knees bowed in your heart as you posture yourself in prayer with God the Father. Here's how God's orchestrated your life. He got you here with a friend through an invite. A random experience in life caused you pain, heartache, questions, doubt. You showed up here. And then God's going to save you this morning so you can get baptized on Easter Sunday. Because God knows there's a huge party going to get thrown for his son at the Chelan County Fairgrounds in three weeks, and he doesn't want you to miss it. And so he got you here this morning. And so, friend, if you walked in under the, the wrath of God apart from Christ and you want to be rescued from God himself. Just, just make that clear. You're not being rescued from your sin first. You're being rescued from God first and his wrath against your sin. Then he sets you free from the bondage of sin. If you want to be set free, if you want to say, I came in not a Christian, I want to declare I am a Christian. Here's the prayer you pray. Father in heaven, with my knees bowed and my heart laid low, I acknowledge I am a sinner in action, in thought, Indeed, I am a sinner by nature and by choice. And I acknowledge I have been living apart from you for myself. And here in this moment, that's over. That ends. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. I'm asking you to forgive me of my rebellion. I'm asking you to make me new. I see now you are God. I see now I make a lousy God. I see now you are holy. I see now I am unholy. I see your son is righteous. I realize now I am unrighteous. I'm admitting that before you. And I need the righteousness of Christ to be mine own. I therefore place my faith in you. That you would forgive me of my sin and fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me new in this moment. God, I don't have all the answers. But I'm realizing in this moment that you are the answer that I need, and I'm reaching out for you in Jesus' name. And with the church's head bowed and eyes closed, if, if you prayed that prayer, I, I, want, I want to know. Would you just slip up your hand for me if you prayed that prayer with me? Thank you. Thank you. Keep it up and looking around here. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. I see it up there. Thank you. Friend, don't miss this moment. Don't miss this moment of rescue and redemption. God loved you enough to orchestrate your whole life to get you here this morning. That he might draw you to himself in love that you might avoid his wrath. Church, let's stand together. Would all of you pray with me? Father in heaven, we're standing before you in your presence rejoicing that there is one who made a way.
There was one who perfectly submitted himself to you and walked out the obedience of faith even as he walked into the teeth of death, even as he felt the full weight of your wrath poured out on him on the cross. Father, we're grateful this morning for Jesus Christ. We're grateful that there has been made a way. We're grateful that there has been the perfect sacrificial propitiating atoning lamb of God that can take away the sin of the world and that can forgive us here even now. Father, we're grateful that as we come to this communion table to remember the body that was broken and the blood that was shed, Lord, there would be a new sense of gravitas and weight in our heart at the price and the cost that it took to set us free. No more blithely going through life. No more just, oh yeah, of course he loved me. That's how the song goes, I get it. No, no, stunned admiration at the good news of the gospel as we get saved all over again. Oh my goodness. I love this story. I love being reminded of the wrath of God. I love the wrath of God because it means that sin won't go unpunished, including mine. And I, I love the grace of God because it saves me from that terrifying reality that I had earned for myself. Whoo! <laughs> I can handle Monday. Monday was overwhelming me today. But that's because I had forgot about the wrath of God that I don't have to deal with on Monday. Thanks be to God. Would you restore perspective to your people, Father? Would you restore faith to your people? Would you put gospel steel into the spine of our backbone that we would stand in your presence, fearless and unashamed, because we've been covered in the blood of Jesus? We ask you would do this work among us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing and we're going to take communion. But here's the deal. By my count, seven, eight, nine, ten hands went up. That means there's some new brothers and sisters in the family of God. We want to connect with you, talk with you. There's connect cards you can fill out. But you need to hear, you need to hear the people of God welcome you into the fold. Welcome you into the family. Yeah. Now, that was a sampling of what's happening in the heavenlies. That was just a sampling. In fact, I feel like we could do a little better. Can we give them a little, a little shot of what's going on in the heavenlies right now? Can we do it? Ready? On three. One, two, three. Yeah! Woo! Woo! Okay. Okay.